Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be, uh, Femi is hosting uh, Anthea Sargent uh, from 2S Water. Uh, my name is Charles Neveze, and I'm the Vice President of Business uh, Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation and also with the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about, um, oh, somebody says volume is low. I think maybe my volume, let me just uh, fix that. All right, I think this may be better. Um, again, my name is Charles Nebeze. I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation and also with um, the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator. Uh, today we're going to be hosting Anthea, who will be talking about real-time data uh, capture to identify metals and atoms in, in water. But before we jump into the presentation, uh, what I'd like to just let you know is that we'll be recording this session and the recording of the session will be made available afterwards as well as the slides. So if you're going to type in that the slides, a question about the slides, we'll make them available for you. I'd like to ask you to type your questions in the chat box and those questions will be answered uh, by Anthea uh, after her presentation. Um, if there's any questions that Anthea is unable to answer online, uh, those uh, questions will be answered uh, by, by Anthea through email uh, after, the, after the event. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you again to Anthea. Anthea, please go ahead. Great, thank you, Charles. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Um, as you guys probably know, since you've made it all the way to our webinar, uh, 2S Water have developed a sensor that detects metals in water in real time. Uh, this sensor has, has progressed nicely. We're now rolling out into the field and I'm happy to be sharing some of our early field data with you today. Um, what we'd like to cover, I'll, I'll just briefly describe the sensor, how it works and, and how it is integrated with existing systems. We'll go over a bit of the field data that we have from our early deploys, and then we can discuss some future applications and where you might be able to, to participate and, uh, and enjoy this new technology with us. Um, so the 2S water aqua valid sensor connects directly to a pipe to detect and quantify metals in water in real time. Uh, here it is. Uh, here's an image of it connected to a pipe, so you can kind of get an idea of how it can integrate with an existing system. Uh, and here is my CTO at one of our early deploys, so you get an idea of the scale of it. It's about uh, uh, three feet by two foot by one foot. So uh, it, it sits next to a pipe, connects directly to an existing sample source, and provides a data point every five to ten minutes. Uh, we have validated 31 different metals and have another 47 in process. Um, all the light colors are the ones that, sorry, all the dark colors are the ones we've validated in lab. Light colored ones are ones that um, we can scientifically see but haven't had an application to, uh, to test yet. And why we have blue and green on there is that we wanted to indicate how many of the critical metals that we have available to us. Um, so the greens on here are our critical metals uh, according to the uh, government of Canada, many of which we have validated is, um, already. Uh, other ones to note of there, uh, we have our scaling metals like our calcium and magnesium. We have effluent metals like uh, nickel, copper, zinc, and of course your revenue generating metals like uh, gold, silver, lithium. All of those have been validated in the system to date. Um, Sorry, I, I see there's a question in the chat regarding the number of uh, the timing. So in fact, we generate a data point every five minutes with the existing sensor system. Now, most people that we talk to can usually make an operational change about every 30 minutes. So we, in, in that 30 minute window, we can provide a trending point of data so that you can make operational decisions regarding uh, what to do. Now, we've designed around easy installation as well. We know that a life is much better if things are not disruptive when you want to install them. Uh, in order to install the unit, we place it in the place that we would like to do the sensing, connect it to the sample line, to the venting in the facility, and to waste and power. Uh, turn it on, run the installation process, and then your data is ready to consume. The system is fully automated. Uh, it, it does sample handling, sample preparation, data generation, and then data delivery. And that data delivery is either done through our, our own web interface. You can log in and see the data at any time. We can set up email reports directly to your email account. And of course, we do control systems integrations. We know that this data is actually the most valuable when you have it when and where you want to make those operational decisions, which is on your operator's control board. Um, 
So let's talk a little bit. That that's the sensor. Um, love to answer some more questions about that uh, when we get to the end here. Um, right now, let's look at some case study data. Um, so right now we have two different applications that we use this sensor for. Uh, one is effluent monitoring. And that's the output of water treatment facilities. We also look at it, the input so that we can perform comparative analysis to optimize the water treatment facility. Uh, our current deploy is monitoring five metals every 10 minutes at a legacy nickel mine. Uh, right now we're doing uh, cadmium, copper, manganese, nickel, and zinc. Um, that was with our MVP unit. We've actually just shipped our beta unit out to this client. It's being installed next week, so that's very exciting for us. That beta unit is going out to three more installations over the summer and early fall here um, in Quebec, Colorado, and in BC, mostly doing affluent monitoring uh, in iron ore, nickel, and, and smelting output. So some really interesting applications around monitoring clean water coming out of the facility. And we're well suited to that due to the low levels of detection that we can support with this system. So all of our metals are in the parts per billion, anywhere from triple digit to single digit, depending on uh, both the metal and the matrix of the water in which we are, we are analyzing it. Um, our, our sensor has had over 3,000 lab validated readings. I do want to qualify that because we do so many continuous readings, I don't have 3,000 lab readings. We've done continuous lab readings intermittently throughout, and during that time, our sensor has been validated as having the correct results. Um, that's been over 750 hours of continuous runtime. Um, and more than 15,000 data points that we have currently generated. Uh, we were monitored our existing site for six months, and in that time, we were very pleased to say that we, we served our purpose and we did what we wanted to do, which was we detected an incident that otherwise would not have been detected coming out of one of these treatment facilities. Um, it was during the, the spring runoff. Um, this is the incident data. You'll notice that it's relatively anonymized because um, this is client data. So, um, but the trend is absolutely what we saw in the field. Um, and what I think is really interesting about this is not only did we detect this happening in a, a sequence that was completely missed by the laboratory testing because it happened so quickly, um, but if you look here, we also detected a an, an event that could predict it. Now, we can't always guarantee that that will be the case with every facility. That's something that we have to learn about the existing conditions in, in your facility, but it's a great indicator that next year we will be able to detect this event coming through before it occurs uh, because we have that early indicator of, of an event starting to happen followed by a major event happening. This data is about a week's worth of data. So uh, the, the first day there was nothing, and then we detected the event, then it was a three-day event that carried out um, at that facility. Um, so it's great that in our, our first deploy, we have served our purpose and actually detected an event and been able to provide some really valuable data back to our client. Um, that's what we've been doing on the effluent side so far, and lots more data coming out on that side as we go along. Love to keep you guys updated. The other place where we like to play with this sensor is in process monitoring. So we can actually deal with high concentration fluids as well as low concentration fluids. It's part of what makes our sensor unique. So we can deal with metals up to saturation point. Um, I do just wanna clarify that when I am talking about detecting metals, I'm talking about dissolved solids. So we can detect dissolved solids up to saturation within metal, uh, within water, sorry. Uh, those suspended solids do flow directly through the system. So um, we don't see those in our analysis um, usually going through. Uh, most of our work on the in-process monitoring to date has been extensively around lithium brines. Uh, it's been really exciting to look at those because they are such a mix of the entire periodic table, pretty much a little bit of everything, and then 20 to 30% sodium just to make life extra fun. Um, and we've looked at lithium brines in both very low concentrations in typical North American brines, as well as high concentration South American brines, and we tend to find the mid-range ones in, in Europe. So a really vast variety of different natural brines that we've dealt with. Um, this same technology can also be used for other high concentration applications. And the ones that we're looking at deploying to are, are things like uh, gold leaching processes, so the gold cyanide process, looking at potash brines. Uh, I see mosaic in the room today. Um, 
as well as dual metal extraction. So when we have streams of say cobalt and nickel coming through, how we can provide the data to properly extract those, as well as the detection of critical minerals into streams where um, they were not necessarily previously being extracted, we can help identify those as potentially new uh, revenue generating opportunities. Um, and the lithium data that we've got has been really fun. Uh, some cool stuff that we've been able to do. We have detected within complicated brines all the way from one to over 8,000 parts per million uh, with, with good accuracy compared to the laboratory. Uh, those samples have been up to 250,000 uh, ppm of TDS in the samples. So dealt with very high, very complicated matrices and 20 to 30% sodium as you tend to find in brines. Uh, we've done North American and South American brines, as well as synthetic ones in order to test uh, against a known number. So we have really great data against that. Uh, and in general, we have found that we have an error bar of about plus or minus 10% with an average error of about 1%. So we're coming in very, very close to, to actual on these samples, which is lovely. Uh, the, the complication of the matrix has not been a significant factor within those, uh, although we are always watching and paying attention to the matrix as it comes along. Um, and as I mentioned before, TDS up to saturation has, has been handled by the machine very well. Um, what we do try and avoid is either hydrocarbons or high levels of TSS coming through the machine. Um, they don't affect the analysis in terms of the data that's generated, where we worry is around clogging and fouling of the sensor. So at this point, we are trying to look for those applications that are low TSS or, or, and low hydrocarbon. And we're willing to work with you to figure out how we can make your input water match our requirements. That's something that we've, we've worked on extensively. So if, if that, I'm not describing the water source that you're interested in, uh, happy to, to take a look at your water sample and see what we can do. Um, here is some of the data that we generated on lithium. Uh, often we would take multiple, uh, one sample and run it multiple times, which gives us a really nice idea of what that error bar is. Um, and as you can see, we, we are moving nicely around that 10% error range with that 1% error uh, coming through. On the, I'm, I want to say left hand, right hand side, but I think your screen might be the opposite of mine. Um, this sample is a North American brine. Uh, this is actually out of uh, the Leduc Basin, I believe. This is a South American brine that we had come through. So very different matrix of, of water, um, but a similar ability to detect and quantify the lithium within them. Um, we would love to get involved with you. I see a bunch of questions in the chat. I'm gonna get to those in a minute. Um, there's lots of ways that you can get involved and, and see if this is a good technological match for your applications. Um, the two way things that we're looking for right now, we are looking for more affluent deploys. Uh, that's where most of our deploys to date have been and, uh, and we're ready to roll out effluent units to your water treatment facility in order to, to see if there's a potential match and if we can detect those events like we did uh, at our existing site uh, to help you guys out. Um, the other place that we're looking for is in-process improvement partners. Uh, often those in-process improvement applications take a little bit more work, uh, a bit more analysis to make sure that we're generating nice clean data for you and that we can deal with the matrix of water that's coming through. So we're looking for partners who are interested in, in working with us on making sure that we can properly identify um, what those are and generate the right kind of data to help you um, optimize your facility. Um, the best way to start working with us, oh, I'm sorry, I've gone the wrong direction. There we go, um, is to, to send us a sample. So we are very happy to perform a sample testing inside our lab. We'll generate a report and send it back to you so that you can see how our sensor performs on your sample. Uh, the other thing that we can do is if you're interested in doing that, we will actually uh, tell you your sample specific level of detection and level of quantification. Uh, because the matrix can play into that, it can be very specific to the site. If you're curious about what, what you think it would be, I'd be happy to connect by email and give you an estimate of where we think those levels of detection and quantification would be. But with just one sample sent to our lab, we can get you some really concise data on that. Um, we also only require a, a half liter sample in order to run extensive testing. I saw a question in the chat there asking how much water we need to sample for reliable data. 
Uh, we do ask for half a liter sent into the lab so that we can perform multiple analysis. The actual sensor system itself only runs through a, a, a few milliliters of water for each sample run. Uh, we really wanted to optimize around applications where the, the fluid that we were analyzing might potentially be revenue generating, like those lithium brines. Um, so we use as little as possible in order to provide a data point. And, uh, and any variance in that is dealt with as we uh, get so many data points that we can provide a real trend of that data. Um, so yeah, I'd, we would love to have you send a sample if that's something that you're interested in. We're happy to sign any NDAs or confidentiality agreements that would make you feel safe to do that. And it's a great way to determine if we can uh, provide you some really interesting data. Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer some of these questions right now. If you have additional questions, please feel free to, to pop them in the chat here. Um, my first question was, uh, what is the power requirements of the unit? Um, so the unit is uh, just a regular plug into the wall and uh, is very low on power consumption. We run about, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, I think about 30 watts per test cycle. It's quite low. Um, even though we are generating a plasma. So uh, we, we do it in a very concentrated area. The plasma itself is about 5,000 degrees, but you can actually get close enough to it. Uh, you, you, you get within a centimeter of it before you start feeling the heat. So it's very concentrated. It uses a very low power source. Um, one of the other questions here, what about uh, in H2SO4? Um, possible. It's something that we'd want to test before we rolled out into the field. Uh, the, the matrix of the water that we're in, um, Usually that's not problematic, but it does change those things like our level of detection and quantification. Uh, so we always would want to start with you guys sending us a sample so that we can run some analysis, make sure that we can actually perform well on that sample. And if something needs to be changed in, in how we're conditioning that sample, then we're quite happy to do that. Um, sorry, I'm just running down the questions now. The sensitivity of our system, yeah. So I, I've touched on that a little bit in terms of uh, we, we are in the parts per billion. Uh, it really is very dependent upon the matrix of water. So to give you an example of that, lithium is probably our, our best metal. We've spent a lot of time on it uh, because it's such a, a, a such high interest and brines are such a complicated matrix. When I'm looking at lithium in tap water, I can get down to uh, triple digit parts per trillion. We can get very, very low. Um, in a lithium brine, I'm usually looking at about one part per million because of that complicated matrix. It makes it a lot harder for us to detect it. Um, if you have a specific application, I can usually tell you where we would expect to see those come in, and then we're happy to run the testing to determine it. In general, uh, anywhere from about 100 parts per billion and down from there. Um, the technology, so I have a question asking about the technology that our sensor is based on, and thank you for that, um, because I, I omitted to mention it, my apologies. We are a plasma-based spectroscopic sensor, um, and yes, we use ICP to validate the results. That was the other question. ICP in the laboratory is a plasma-based spectroscopic analysis. Same core concept. So the data that we're generating is apples to apples comparison with ICP. Um, However, we generate the plasma in a very different way. That's, you know, obviously you can't take your ICP and connect it directly to your pipe. If you could, there would be no market for us and everyone would be very happy. Um, but since you can't, that's why we came in and developed this entirely different variant of plasma-based spectroscopy to overcome some of the challenges that ICP has around a real-time metal detection. So we use ICP lab results in order to verify. We either use MS or OES, depending on, on the application and, and how complicated that water is is. Um, and that's been our, our primary form of validation to date. Um, and we use, uh, when we do those independent um, verifications, we always use an independent laboratory as well to perform that. Um, the salinity thresholds, so we are still working through um, the uh, long-term trials on 30% sodium. We are not finding that it affects well, it, while it affects our, our readings, that is an overcomable problem. Where we are still doing a little bit of learning is on how that affects the long-term maintenance of the machine. Our goal with this machine was to design something that was very, very low maintenance. We want a quarterly maintenance cycle uh, with an annual kind of refurb. Um, it is likely in the very high salinity cases that we will have a closer to monthly uh, 
maintenance cycle in order to deal with crystallization on the inside of the machine. However, in terms of data generation, we've dealt with those very high salinity uh, matrices and, and that is something that we're comfortable dealing with. Um, the data format from our unit, so the, the, the data right now, the path of the data is uh, we generate raw spectral data. We send that to the cloud for analysis. Uh, our, our heavy analytical engine is up there. It, it converts that data about light into data about metals. And then we deliver that data as a parts per million or parts per billion number um, to the operator. Uh, and then we will do uh, control system integration on a case by case basis, dealing with the control system that you have. So that's something that we're happy to customize based upon specific clients. Um, or we can move internally or entirely outside your system, if that makes sense as well. Um, uh, Bill asked what LOD and LOQ stand for. Thank you for that. I should have those defined on my page. And that is level of detection and level of quantification. So um, basically I can detect a metal um, under a certain range, but maybe not quantify it. So uh, say, and, and using just random numbers from one part per billion to 10 parts per billion, I could say, Yes, I see that there is copper in there. I know that it is less than 10 parts per billion, but I couldn't tell you exactly what number it was. It is more than one and, and less than 10. Once we hit that 10, then I can say, oh, you've got 11.5 uh, parts per million of copper. Um, so that was what the difference is between the level of detection where we can detect but not quantify and the level of quantification where I can clearly quantify exactly how much of that metal is in there. Um, uh, Bernard has said in uh, effluent limits are generally on total metals and they also include a TSS number. Do we have a solution to measure this? Uh, so how we have dealt with this to date is that we often find in most cases that the TDS and the TSS, so, the, and the, so that your total metals number often track quite closely together. And because we have a very low level of detection, um, we can come in underneath your site limit detecting those dissolved metals as long as there is a strong correlation between those two, then we can provide a very valid data point that, that helps you do your effluent limits, even though we're looking at the dissolved metals and not the suspended metals. Um, th that's something that we'd be happy to look at with you on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that those two data points track together and we can perform that kind of analysis. Um, Michael has a couple questions for me here. Um, do we have testing for TSS in treated water? So it, again, our system does not actually do TSS testing. Um, we do the total dissolved solids. Um, do we have testing for arsenic in water? Uh, yes, so we can detect arsenic in water. Uh, right now, arsenic is one of a suite uh, where we do have a slightly higher detection limit than we would like. Uh, we know what to do to get it down there, but as a startup, uh, it, the world is a list of priorities. So we do have arsenic detection in water, and I'd love to talk to you about what specific uh, levels you're looking at so that we can tell you if we're in the range of where you need to be or if we need to keep working a little bit more. Um, would it be possible to get a probe that continuously tests water coming in and out of process? So we are a slipstream technology and not a probe technology. However, we can connect directly to a point and provide a data point every five minutes on a process. So, so yes, but not with the probe, I think is the answer there. Um, Sultan asks, are we working on or have worked on developments to say manufacturing industry or uh, shopping malls that are looking to cut down on effluent costs on wastewater processing. We are definitely looking for more applications around that. To date, all of our deploys have been in water treatment facilities, um, but we absolutely know that there's more applications outside of that. So would love to, to have that discussion. Um, just before I continue answering the, the questions, uh, my co-founder, Tony, has stepped on here. Um, we are going to be at PDAC. Uh, next week. So if there's people in the room who would like to, to meet us, uh, Tony will be there. Um, I'm also available to connect with. So um, please do come. I will be reaching out to people uh, at the uh, after this webinar to see if we can set up a meeting with you either at PDAC or after this event. Um, but, but it was a great opportunity to come speak to you right before so that we could potentially get this opportunity to connect. We'd love to meet anybody in the room in person uh, if you're gonna be in Toronto next week. Yeah, just to let Tony know, Tony, I did unmute you. So if you would like to contribute or to say anything, please go ahead. 
Okay, hello everybody. I'm glad to have finally made it into this meeting. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. I would be pleased to meet with anybody who is going to be at PDAC. Great. Um, and I see a question from Patrick. Are there plans to develop this technology and detect ultra trace pathfinders at parts per trillion levels? Yes, absolutely. So I think um, driving down our detection limits into that range is something that we're working very hard on uh, and, and continually improving our, our results on as we grow a larger and larger database of known values. Um, for a new stage technology, having that basis of, of data is a really big part of how we drive down our detection limits. We are absolutely focused on, on getting down into that range. We're not quite there yet, but we are working our way there uh, as we speak. Okay. Um, any additional questions? Did I get everybody? Yeah, we a are question. running. You, you yeah, do have a question. Ahead. There's a question from Michael. I don't know if you answered that one. From oh, the uh, the regarding the arsenic. Yes, we did. We did cover that one. So okay, we can so detect well. arsenic, um, not as low levels as some of the other metals that we're looking at in our current model but definitely very happy to, to talk. Oh, sorry, yes, there was a question uh, regarding costs. So right now the sensor, we are either selling the sensor directly uh, with the trailing data and support fee, or we can do a sensor as a service model where we come in as an operational expense. Um, the costing of the sensor depends a lot upon the application in terms of what kind of adaptation that we need to do to that existing water coming in. And would love to, to have a conversation with anybody about that. Um, if, if they have a specific application that allows us to kind of do that, that costing out for you. So um, uh, does the accuracy of the unit increase with the size of the unit? So what is really interesting about this technology is that the core sensor actually can see all of those metals. So the, the size of the sensor and the layout of the hardware doesn't change based upon which metals you're wanting to look at. How we change that is with a software optimization process. Um, so that makes it really interesting because right now we're rolling out metals or sensors doing five metals per sensor. By this time next summer, we expect to be having those same sensors looking at 10 metals per sample test. So it's, it's a continually improving process and we're adding more and more metals on all the time. Uh, is gray water reuse an application something that would be good for 2S water? So water reusage is near and dear to our hearts, actually. That's, uh, that's one of the real benefits that we see as a potential to bring to industry. Um, and especially in applications where that water going back into process can potentially impact the quality of the output. So if we look at things like semiconductor and food and beverage, where the water recycled actually will impact the process going forward, that's a great application where we can really help increase the water usage. Um, I have a question about the commissioning time. After install, how long before the, the customer can get reliable data? Uh, so we start generating data the same day that we do the install. Uh, we usually like to, to verify that against one laboratory testing. So we'll generate you results right away. Um, it, our inhibiting factor on that will be how long does the lab take to get back to us, which is the core problem we're trying to solve is that that can be a long test cycle. Um, but we start generating data from day one of the installation. Absolutely. And, and we did deliver that data to you right away. So very quick is the answer. <laughs> and the commissioning process itself is usually about a half day process. Uh, in general, we're having somebody out to the site for about three days. They stay and make sure everything's running very well and perform that, that secondary validation in order to make sure that the system is functioning absolutely correctly. So it's a very quick process. I, I, I don't know if we have time for another question. I'm seeing, seeing 59 here, uh, Charles. Oh yeah, for sure, you know, go ahead. Let's, let's go right to the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I think that might be all of our questions today. Does anyone have any more questions? You can type it or you can unmute and, oh, I don't know if you can unmute, maybe Charles yeah, is yeah, taking well, away your privilege. I, 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 oh, wow. <laughs> I have definitely given back everybody the privilege to unmute. So if anybody awesome. wants to unmute, ask, ask a question, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, there's one more question in the chat, go ahead. Sure, yeah, so uh, we the question is, do we need to send a sample to do you need to send a sample to us before commissioning? We really prefer to get a sample. If it's possible for us to run a sample ahead of time, it makes it 
it, it really ensures that we're going to be successful at that deploy because we can do a lot of the software work ahead of time. It, it also lets us know if we need to bring any kind of filtration into your water system to get that nice clean data. Uh, like any process, you know, uh, the data, the quality of water that goes in determines the quality of data that we get out on, on the far side. So it is our strong preference to get a sample before commissioning. Is it strictly necessary? No, but there's going to have repercussions on how long that commissioning can take then. All right, let's uh, have one more one more question and then we, we can uh, wrap it up. I think, go ahead. There's a question from Patrick, but let's do the last two questions. One from Patrick and one from Disco. Please go ahead. Sure. Uh, so the the this presentation will be published. Charles is going to uh, publish yes. this presentation. Uh, in addition to that, if you find yourself sitting a half an hour from now going, wait a sec, I had a question I really wanted to ask and I forgot. Uh, please go ahead and send me an email. I think I, I sorry, I should have had that slide up for the last bit here. Um, I, I'm available. I'm happy to jump on a quick call. I'm happy to answer a quick question via email. Please don't hesitate. Um, the power requirements for the unit was the last one. So we are a regular, uh, a regular plug, uh, 120 volts. We just go straight into the wall. Um, we take about uh, we'll see if Tony corrects me on this because I was sure I got it wrong before. <laughs> 30 watts per test. Is that right, Tony? We're about uh, three to five amps uh, draw yeah. on a on a 120 <laughs> volt circuit. Thank you. Okay, there there's you the correct I answer. Said, okay. I knew there was I, a three in there. Yeah, that was about yeah. all I got right. <laughs> I said, there's, there's a question here that I think we, we, we must answer because it asks yeah. about those regulations and standards. Because yes, I think our you. industry is heavily, heavily regulated. Is there anything in the way that you, people need to be aware of before deploying the unit? Uh, so there's no specific required uh, regulations in order to deploy this unit. That's the good news. The bad news is that means that we cannot be your laboratory reporting. So you will need to do your, your legally required reporting in the laboratory. We can provide you really good predictive data that tells you how that's going to happen and prevent any kind of incidences that happen in between. Um, some of our clients do prefer CSA certification and how we've been handling that to date uh, is getting units uh, certified on a case by case basis. So if you require a uh, certain certification, that's something we're happy to work towards and, and get for you. Uh, we know that there are some that, that make life more useful. Um, and and the Charles will be will you be sending out the recording of the presentation after this, Charles? Yes, yes, I will be uh, sure. uh, through a YouTube link. Again, maybe just to wrap it up. Thank you everybody for attending the session. Uh, this was great information, Anthea. You know, real time detection of heavy metals in solution is possible. It's here now, and Tears Water is doing it. So thank you again for attending, and we appreciate everybody. Uh, see you at PDAC. Those of you who are going, take care. Great. Thanks bye -bye everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.